another Timber Spear Gun do. Today it's Ocean State Spear Guns, Matthew Novakovic. Welcome back to the New Story Podcast. My name is Shrek. If you are new here for the first time, this is the podcast where we interview spearfishing experts, authorities and characters from around the world. Today we're geeking out on Timber Spear Guns, a little bit like last week with Will Brunker, but Matthew has his own take on it. He's based there on the East Coast uh on the east coast of the u.s and making these fantastic spear guns check them out on instagram at ocean state spear guns uh i don't want to muck around too much today but i did want to say a quick thank you to the patron listeners powering the new story podcast keeping fuel in the outboard and keeping us rolling join 50 more at patreon.com forward slash Noob Spiro, and consider supporting the podcast on an episode-by-episode episode basis. But even if you're just frothing on this podcast, share it with your mates. Tell them all about it, what episode you like, and what episode you recommend and why. And uh, that'd be fantastic too. But hey, let's get into it. Ocean State Spear Guns. I can't wait to get into today's episode. Brought to you with proud partner, adreno.com.au. The Noob Spiro podcast has been partnering with adreno.com.au for more than 100 episodes, and these guys are awesome. They have uh, huge spearfishing mega stores all over the country. You can shop online or in store. Use the code Noob Spiro whenever you spend more than $200, and you will automatically save $20. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro online or in store when you spend more than $200 and save 20 bucks. I love these guys. I remember the first time I bought a spear gun at adreno.com.au down at the Wall and Gabba store. And Adreno have been a huge part of the excitement that I have about spearfishing. Check them out at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear to save. Neptonics was founded in 1996, making trigger mechs in a barn in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Solid gear that works was their founding principle, and it still rings true today in every pull of a Neptonics trigger, in every snap of a Neptonics band, and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Got a great deal. You can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off anything and everything at Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. Save 10% off any order at Neptonics.com when you use the code NOOB10. G'day, Noobers. Today I've got Matthew No No Novakovic. Novakovic. Nova- yeah. <laughs> I was going to butcher it that. again. Don't worry. Yeah, Novakovic <laughs> from uh, Ocean State Spear Guns, uh, mate. You live in uh, a small town in in Rhode Island. Is that right? Yep, that's right. So We're sp- about two hours south of Boston, three hours north of New York City. Okay, and you're spearing the just the beautiful, clear, tropical waters of. Uh, of the Atlantic there. Yep. Yep. Nice and clear. <laughs> Mate, it's still a beautiful part of the world. Like that Rhode Island, like it just seems like a great getaway if you live in that part of the world to get over there and just have a, have a week over there. Like, uh, Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, everyone kind of overlooks it from the, uh, the ocean, the lifestyle, the, the, the waterman lifestyle. But I mm. mean, this is where surfing New England, or sorry, uh, East coast surfing started with the guys coming back from, uh, World War II in Hawaii, they came out here. Yeah. Um, we got sailing, surfing. The fishing is unreal. I've had guys from the Keys I was talking to um, who I've met through spear fishing and the spear gun business. And they come up here for to visit and they're blown away. The fishery that we have here, they're like, this, this is some awesome fishing, you guys. Yeah, yeah. That's like the Keys are legendary. So, yeah. Well, you guys got that big bass fishery off there. You've got Tor oh, yeah. Tog. And what are, what are some of the other local fish that you love to chase? Yeah, well, those are the those are two big ones. The the, the tog are the tog. Um, some people call them blackfish. Yeah, um, that's what everyone kind of starts with because they're kind of shallow. Yeah, um, pretty easy to hunt. They get pretty beefy. Actually, the uh, the, the world record was caught right out right off uh, the Thames River, New London, right right down the street from where I work. Oh which yeah, is pretty wild. I just like um, saying it with the accent, trying to say like tar tog, tar tog. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a there's a thousand nicknames. Yeah. Tog, Togzilla, Black, Blackfish. My my favorite is Kenny Toggins. <laughs> uh, yeah. So but, are, are um, they are they good eating? Are they like? Yeah, they're actually. I had some myself uh, for dinner. Yeah, they're they're great to eat. Yeah, sweet. They're they're pretty easy to hunt. They're shallow and they're yeah. pretty inquisitive, so they'll kind of just wander up to you. But they definitely taste good. They just have a nice firm white flesh. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, the, the striper are legendary. Yeah, so, striped uh, bass. Sorry, what was that? Yeah, the striped bass. Yeah. Oh yeah. That uh, David Hotch, David Hotchman from Spirit Charters, the Block Island um, guy. Like he he made those fish like um, 
they they came on everyone's radar. I think when we saw some of the shots coming out of uh, his his, um, his charter. Oh yeah, no, his yeah he he puts you on the fish. I've actually ha- already have a date in the books with him for this uh, this summer. Yeah, nice. I've never met met the hint, the man himself, but yep. um, definitely looking forward to getting out the block with him. He's a clever dude too. He's a clever dude. Yeah, no. He's, he does seem like a pretty cool dude. His boat's actually right down the street from us. Oh, sick. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And the, the visibility out on Block Island gets way better than the inshore yep. waters we have here. So mm. He'd be a good man to get uh, one of your spear guns into his hands, I reckon. Yeah, I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so Ocean State spear guns, you've been, you've been playing around for a little while. Um, and you've sent a spear gun. You've sent a spear gun to... To Cameron Kirkconnell, is that right? That's correct, yep. Okay. Tell us that story, how that sort of all eventuated and how long have you been making guns for? Yeah, I've been actually making guns for a little over two years now. So um, I actually I got into spearfishing a little late in the game. I was always a hunter and a fisherman, um, just line fishing. Is that a um, – sorry, while, while we're there, is that a whitetail um, set of antlers up behind you? Oh, yeah, yeah, that is. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> Yep. Awesome. Yeah, no, harvested right here on my land. So. Oh, awesome. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. So yeah, I've been into hunting and fishing my whole life. Um, spear fishing is kind of something I thought of doing when I was really little. I uh, I grew up going down to the Outer Banks down in North Carolina. It's um, it's a little for it's like five five six hundred miles south of here. Yeah. Um, my dad grew up going out there. Um, we had. He, uh, my grandmother lives down down there, and we were in this beach house sitting there. And I was, I was like, you know what? There's a shipwreck right off the beach here. I'm gonna go out there with this pole spear and this mask and these flippers and uh, all rental stuff. Well, yeah. the pole spear was a dowel rod with some surgical tubing that I sharpened. <laughs> it was like I was 16 years old. Went out there. It was horrible visibility. I thought I was gonna get eaten by a shark. Uh, went down, you know, 10, 15 feet. Nice. Knocked my mat. It was hor- yeah. It was such horrible viz. I hit my mask on the wreck, flooded the mask, freaked out, and swam back in and didn't think about it for 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, a good friend of mine, he, he, he got into, he was a fisherman with a, a, a fishing friend of mine, mm. um, and he got me into the game, the spear fishing game, and saw so all these wooden guns guys were using, and I was like, you know what? Uh, I come from a woodworking background. My, my father, he was in, into woodworking. He actually has his uh, uh, home building business. So I grew up around tools. I had a whole wood shop myself oh, before cool. I started the spear gun business. Like I could build one of those. So mm-hmm. I, uh, I put one or two together myself and started to have fun shooting it and, uh, took some fish down, um, posted some videos on it, some, some Facebook and social media. Mm-hmm. And this guy down in Texas, he was like, Hey, I want you to build me a, one of those guns. I was like, come again. You want one of these guns? <laughs> he's like, yeah, yeah, for sure. So he he we he talked back, we went back and forth. I wrote him also a bill and he sent me some money and I sent him a gun. Ah, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> and that's yeah, Ocean, and then, Ocean State Spear Guns w- w- was born. That yeah. Th- then from there on out, my wife, uh, she's the business major of the family. She she told me you, you should probably, you know, tax purposes and such. You should make a business. And so we we, we set up a business. Um, and it's kind of gone from there. Cool. Uh, I started, started local guys, started getting some guns. Um, but then I started, you know, I, I, I was building these guns and they look like the standard rectangular barrel and nothing fancy. I mean, mm. the, the billers and the rice they're, they're, they're they were all of that shape. Um, and I kind of, you can't really compete with those manufacturers. They're just the volume they put out the mm. time and the, the research and development. Um, so I was really trying to look for that, that thing that I could offer, um, that the other, the, the, the bigger names couldn't. And, and I, I went on this, this custom, I wanted everything, the customer to like work with me and like, if you want some crazy band set up or a specific length, a lot of guys up here in this murky water, like the mid handles. So yeah, yeah. you can play around with the mid handle length where you like it in uh, fit to fit into your arm. So I started building those. Uh, and then I got actually alumni. I, I actually went to the same school as Cameron Kirkconnell. Oh, wow. Um, so I just, out of the blue, I re- reached out to him. I was like, hey, can I send you one of my guns? And shoot it and give me some feedback. <laughs> uh, he's like, he, he's really gracious about it. And he's like, yeah, sure. Why not? So oh, man, that's looking, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Before, but before I even 
sent one down. He looked at my uh, designs. He's like, you know, it's, they're pretty plain Jane. You, you want to you wanna go towards this cuttlefish shape design. Um, and I hadn't, I looked at them, but it seemed like a lot of work. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't know about it. If it was really up to that, if it was, if it was worth all that effort to do, because they're all hand, I hand shaped them all with a plane and a spoke shave. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but he said that was, if I was going to be making custom guns, that's the custom gun I'd, I'd want to build. And I tell you what, ever since I, so I sent him one, um, and he wanted, he wanted to further refine it, the muzzle, um, he wanted a couple other refinements that we weren't work, work back and forth on. And then, uh, I sent him a second one. Um, and since, since I started building that gun, man, I tell you what, I have, <laughs> I, it's just kind of blown up in my face. Everyone wants one of the cuttlefish shapes. I mean, yeah, cool. the, the custom wood spear gun market is a pretty niche market, mm. but that gun seems to, if you want a custom wood spear gun, that's, that's kind of the one that people like to have. So. Yeah. Yeah. But but as you say, there's a fair bit of work in shaping it, and it's not a lot of. Oh yeah, I think like you can do it. You're doing a a, a composite. I take it, and how how does that process? Yeah, it's just yeah. I just so I, I start with a couple. I, I have a local supplier who I, I work through to get the wood, um, but it's so hard to find straight grained uh, wood of that those dimensions because it's mm. they're they're almost like four and a half inches wide, but only an inch and a quarter deep. Mm. When you start that blank, but to get a piece of lumber like that, that's straight, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you take a lot of uh, thinner strips called laminations uh, and you glue them all together or yeah. epoxy them, uh, let it cure for a while. And then, then you start the shaping process. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, and then once, once you do it, the glue lines look pretty slim. You, you, you can barely, unless you really look at it or you get two really off color pieces of wood. Mm. Um, It'll, it'll, it'll really, uh, it blends together really well. It's a clever idea to reach out to Cam Kirkconnell. And I mean, it's great having that connection with him through, through your school and stuff. Um, yeah. And, and it, it shows a bit of wisdom in the fact that you didn't assume like you knew everything and you were willing to sort of take the advice of an extreme veteran who's been doing this stuff for a long, long time. Um, oh yeah, who am I to argue with? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the gun you've sort of worked out, like you've got a really good video explaining this process on your Instagram. So if people want to check that out, it's Ocean State Spear Guns on Instagram. Uh, and I, I really respected and liked the fact that you went about it in such a sort of a clever way. Um, how many of these guns are you sort of producing now, like a year or a month? Um, to be honest with you, my biggest struggle right now is just getting out there and getting people to see them. Yeah. Um, that, that's really, that's really the thing because people see them and they love them. Mm. So I've started, I really started building those late last summer. Mm. I brought one to a local club's meet and everyone was looking at it. Um, shout out to the tri-state spear fishermen, yeah. um, or the, the tri tri-state skin divers. Yeah. We had a big species meet and they all, uh, everyone was looking at it and everyone, everyone loved it. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I got a lot of feedback from that and the order started trickling in. I, usually have like four or five going on at a time on the bench yeah um so oh, wicked so have you still got a day job oh yeah. yeah 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 i've uh actually been using i really uh really been sinking all a lot of money back into the shop to make it more streamlined because like, i started off and it the shop couldn't produce more than one gun at a time and now it's i'm, I'm getting there with the tooling so yeah, cool cool you gotta think laterally too when you're starting off like and you gotta it's a, it's just a series of problems, like any business. I guess uh, when you're making something too, like one-off things, like what you're doing, like it's very much just a a process of like obstacle overcome, obstacle <laughs> overcome. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I'm 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 looking at some of the spear guns that you're pulling out of there on your Instagram, and um, so it's some impressive work, man. You um, you're obviously finding a lot of enjoyment in making these guns as well. Oh yeah, you you got to to, to build one of these guns. It's I mean, th they're a lot of money, but at the end of the day, it's, it's not, it's not the money. Cause a lot of that, a lot more time and effort and material goes into those guns than I deliver. So it's, yeah. it's all, a lot of passion that goes into it. I, I do love the woodworking aspect of it. Mm. Uh, it's just time to decompress in the shop. Really, really uh, grown to enjoy that time. Mm. So Rewinding back to your story. So 16, you swam out with a hand spear to a wreck. You banged your head and didn't have a great experience. 15 years later mm -hmm. in your early 30s, 
you decided to have another crack and uh, your mate sort of got, got you into it. Did he help you with, that, with the gear and stuff as well or? Yeah, yeah, no, he, he told me exactly. He set me up with what I needed and uh, he didn't steer me wrong. Um, and we went out and had a lot of fun, you know, just up here just to get in the water in the, in the, the heat of the summer, you need a three mil. Yeah. Most of the shoulder seasons you're, you're using a five mil for a good majority of it. Um, in the off but, season, you're not diving at all. No, I surf. So I still get in the water, but uh, the fish go, the get fish go deep. And if they're uh, even there, um, yeah, they just, you really have to wait until water temps come above, I don't know, say 50 ish to even yeah. think about it. I usually go out the opening, um, for tog April one. Usually it's about the water is the low forties and whew, we just go out just because it's, you know, it's been a long winter. We want to get in the water. Yeah. Yeah. Usually yeah. go out and we, we have these grand illusions of seeing one fish lurking in there and this, it's barren. <laughs> so. Uh, so I didn't realize that they, the fish hit a deeper, like, Particularly for the winter there, I didn't realize that that was a that was a fact as well. I figured it was just because the water was cold and maybe dirty. Um, in the winter, honestly, it get. I've seen the best biz in the in the uh, in the winter and early spring because mm. less of less of it getting dirty. But I think the algae. Mm. This is my own personal theory: is that the, the algae just isn't there because of the temperatures. But late in the season, you you'll you won't see all the sunlight will come be coming through the water and it'll be just glittering. Mm. Off of all the suspended sediment and algaes and wow. some of the best visibilities early season. So what's the what's the predominant current pushing nutrients in there? Like and um does it move with the seasons? Um the so the our look we're in a very uh strange area. We're at the just the mouth of the Long Island Sound dumps out into the Atlantic Ocean and the Block Island Sounds right there. Mm. Um so you got a lot of strong current. Um, a couple uh, relatively big rivers are actually also local here, and we have the Narragansett Bay. Um, so you have a lot of estuary waters dumping in. So tide is huge on visibility for us. Mm. Um, but yeah, the, we do have some pretty strong currents just due to that inflow and outflow of the tide, the tidal currents. Mm. A little further off stream, offshore, we have the, the Gulf Stream, but that's really unless you got a big boat and a lot of money. You're yeah. not, you're not fishing that. Yeah. Um, that's bigger down in North Carolina. Yeah. We go down there and fish a lot down there. My, uh, my family and I, um, but there we're only like 60 miles off the, the Gulf stream. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, wow. it's crazy. It's a different part of the world. So I've, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Um, so walk me through though. So you might like, did you just head out shore diving? Um, for these yeah, initial well, forays? Well, we did do a bunch of shore shore dives um we have a we have a lot of really good shore diving spots around here we did a bunch of kayak fishing as well he also had a boat he also him and his uh, brother have a boat as well so a little 23 well craft um bow rider so yeah nice. we definitely we we did the spread of it but to be honest with you we do the majority of our diving is you know trying to squeeze it in bef- before or after work or on a weekend yeah. around the, fa- the around the family so a lot of times it's just easier to do a shore dive and just enjoy being in the water. So what are you diving? Headlands? Are you diving like, is it, is it rocky reef? Um, you've got like a lot of bomby structure. So I think that the Block Island structure, there was some decent like big rock, like boulders and bombies around that I saw. Like, is it? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. That, so it really depends on how you're accessing it. So yeah, we're, we're, we're fishing that with, if we're out in the boat, if you can get out a little further into the rips. Um, but you really got to have a, a boat to, to fish those. Uh, we usually drop two divers in or at least or a pair of divers or two pairs of divers in and drift, drift the reef because we'll, the currents rip through there and we'll drop down on them and do however many drops until we're off the reef and you're off into the sand and then have the boaty come pick us up and rinse and repeat. Mm. Um, but if we're shore diving, yeah, there's a lot of headlands. It's just we got a really huge uh, or a vast variety of what we can, what and how we can target it. Okay. Different species, yeah. Cool. So that sounds good. Like, and it sounds like you can put your thought in if you're strategic, like at particular times of year, or you want to target a specific thing, then you can uh, probably affect your results and your take home catch quite easily. What's a what's a fish that's you love hunting there? And I'd love to hear a story. Um, I guess for us scup or porgy, it's um, 
not the most glamorous fish. The uh, keeper size is nine inches, so they're not so big, mm. uh, but they're great eating fish and they're really challenge you as a hunter. I absolutely love hunting them. You, you go down, you drop down, you get on the bottom and you kind of stop moving and hide and you don't see them. The visibility, you, I mean, we're happy for a 10 or 15 foot day, biz day. Yeah. So they're way out, way out there and you don't see them. And all of a sudden you see these, um, you don't really see it when you bring the fish out of the water, but underwater there's this, uh, like this, this vertical band on them that you kind of just see out of the murk appearing. Okay. And, uh, just, just waiting for them to come in. So it's a big waiting game and plus they're a small target. So, mm. um, so what happens? How big's a big one? I don't know. Big, big, big one. I don't know. Like 12, 13 inches. Yeah. Right. They're, not, right. they're not big. They're not big fish, but you get a couple of those. They're tasty. Yeah. Sick. But yeah, they really test your skills as a hunter. To be honest with you, most of my GoPro videos of me hunting them is just, oh, he's he's pointing off into the murk. And there's a fish. Ah, oh, you can't even it's see rich. it. Yeah. No, you can't even see it. Yeah. You, sometimes you can grade that footage. Like, um, have you done much color grading? Like with a no, not at all. No. If you like, it, it's a real like people geek out on it endlessly. But like, I s- took some GoPro footage and I put it in DaVinci Resolve, which is free to use. Um, but like you're talking about, you've got to sync, uh, let's call it invest about eight to 10 hours into it before you start to get your head around how to use it. But you, when you start using the color grading part of it, um, you can make pretty shitty footage look pretty decent. Like, uh, really? yeah, yeah. And, you know, because sometimes like you're in the water and you think, oh, yeah, I've got like 12 to 15 feet visibility or whatever. But then you look at your GoPro footage and it looks like you've literally got six to eight feet of visibility, you know, and you can't even see the oh, fish. Yeah. They're like outside oh, yeah, of shot. But if you put that footage in Resolve and you color grade it, quite often it will give you a more accurate representation of the visibility you actually had on the day. But it just takes a little bit of tinkering and there's a, a bit of a learning curve. But particularly I think when you're in low light areas or you're in places where, you know, you don't get that bang in Hawaii like footage that we all love to see. Um, but yeah, it just gives you a little bit more room to play around with it a bit and actually make a video that your family and friends can watch and appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I'll definitely have to check into that. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how much time I have, but, uh, one of my, one of my good friends, actually the twin brother of the guy who introduced me to spear fishing, he's kind of become my graphics guy and he, yeah, nice. he loves geeking out on the, the, the audio visual, audio visual stuff. So Nice. I'm sure he'll take a whack at it. It's it's um like it's like anything. Like you know, like you start off with a stock wood and you produce a spear gun. I think when you start off with um like a whole bunch of raw footage and you turn it into something that other people can actually watch and appreciate, like you, you oh yeah, you know, there's a level of um satisfaction that comes with the work you put into it. So oh, hundred percent. Um, mm. So. Porgy are another species you like to hunt. You've got tall talk. What about striped bass? Do you, do you, do you get them much? Oh yeah. We, we shoot some good striped bass. Um, it's a, it's a bigger species and they are threatened to a certain uh. degree. So we try, we try to limit our take on those. The difficult thing with those right now is we have a, this, they call the Size slot. Limit. So you, yeah, the slot, the slot is difficult. Oh. It's 28 to 30. 28 to 35 inches. So you're, so yeah. you're sitting there at 40 foot depth yeah. and really crappy viz, usually in current. And you got to judge something like, Oh, is the fish within this band? Yeah. <laughs> Seven like, inches. It's like, it's yeah. tiny. Yeah. And you're talking a fairly large fish. So I yeah. mean, I'd imagine like the way we learn to size a lot of fish underwater is by shooting them and then pulling them up and then going, Oh yeah, that's, Oh yeah, that's, it's smaller than I thought it was, or hey, that's heaps <laughs> bigger than I thought it was. You know, like that's kind of spearfishing if we're honest about it. And particularly when you're yeah. starting out, and, and you know, like our our vision is distorted. Our perception, our visual perception, doesn't give us an accurate representation of the world. After a while, and with experience, we teach ourselves to be better judges of size and dimensions underwater. But it's a learning curve. And oh, hundred percent. I'd imagine with striped bass, you know, with this very small band of acceptably sized fish you're allowed to shoot like you would make mistakes it would just be if you're honest that would just be part of the learning curve with them yeah that's part of the learning curve mm. what are, what are the bag limits how many are you allowed striped bass just one 
Okay. okay. One per fisherman per day. So even if you shot like one that was maybe an inch under size, um, but you shot your one for the day, your impact on the fishery is still not going to be too bad. I mean, it's great that you guys are thinking sustainably about it, but yeah. yeah. To be honest with you, I don't. The, I don't think the the bane of fishermen or a spear fishermen isn't going to wipe out the striped bass. I mean, the line fishermen like to look down at us and say, "Oh, you're you're killing all the fish," but the the catch and release mortalities are. Uh, completely understated so i mean 40 foot depth so that's easy enough for him to pop a swim bladder and those fish aren't gonna survive yeah. So. yeah i mean we're we're pulling them up from even deeper when we're when we're line fishing too so i mean i don't know um that minimum size limit they have is that um around about just after their first sort of reproductive cycle are you familiar much with um the biology and breeding of the fish um to be honest with you, I'm not up that up to speed on them, but I do. I, it, there are a few breeding cycles in there. They, the, the um, but I'm I'm definitely no fishologist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Me either. But I like to pretend sometimes I throw around some big words so people think I'm smarter than I am. But, uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in terms of getting started, though, like say you were early 30s again, what was the maybe your biggest obstacle? Uh, for me, uh, equalizing my ears were definitely my, my, uh, the, the big challenge for me. Okay. Just, I just, it didn't come natural for me. I have friend, friends who we just, without any training, they just go out and just equalize, equalize, equalize. And just, that's it for me. I, it took a lot even, and every single time it would be hard. Oh, my ear, ears can equalize, but, uh, I took, did a bunch of Adam Stern videos and okay. then ended up, um, doing, I, Ted Hardy actually has a, a paid, uh, road, class roadmap with, roadmap yeah. to frenzel yep yeah i took that and that i mean that right there completely changed my diving like i, I took that and it would, yeah because he, he breaks it down in these small little chunks and you're like oh this is really dumb because i practice it on the way into work I put it on and listen to it <laughs> as i'm driving into work and, it, and you're doing these like ridiculous face contortions yeah. <laughs> and neck neck things and yeah. making all these weird noises and like this How's this ever going to work? He puts it all together. And at the end of it, you're like, why didn't he just tell me to do that? This is the easiest thing in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that, but, that that process is um, just something people have got to go through sometimes, like understanding the very small mechanics, baby steps, and then like teaching equalizing to people. I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around it. Like this, it's all yeah. happening. You can't see what's happening and what the person's doing. You explain it your best which is probably incorrect anyway, and somehow they get it. But, I mean, Ted taught hundreds and hundreds of, like, Skype equalizing sessions before he made that course. So I think that's why his method works. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You're trying to teach someone how to utilize a muscle they didn't even know they had. <laughs> if you go to noobspirit.com forward slash Ted, I've got all his courses there available so people can check him out. But that roadmap to friends, I've heard lots of um, – good stories on it and it's something that I'm going to send my students to if they have problems got a sweet deal for you today guys go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from Adam Stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines there's frenzel advanced frenzel and hands free equalization mouthful deep frenzel equalization by fitting essentials these are courses that will give you the one percents that will allow you to improve Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off at freedivingfamily.com. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Hey, guys, I wanted to tell you about one of my favorite books of all time. It's Into the Wild by John Krakauer. It's the story of a bloke who chops his credit cards up, donates his money to Oxfam, and heads off into the wild. It's a craziness I can relate to, and there's a movie based on the book, which I also like. But this book and the audio book is absolutely phenomenal. I'd encourage you to check it out for free at noobspiro.com forward slash audible. There's more than 180,000 titles to choose from. So even if you don't like my taste in books, that's 100% understandable, by the way. You can still enjoy what you like at noobspiro.com forward slash audible. You get a free audio book download and a 30-day free trial. Again, at noobspiro.com forward slash audible. A-U-D-I-B-L-E. Check it out. Boom. Trek dude, you're killing it on the Noob Spiro podcast. Every guest you get on froths on the spearing lifestyle and the actionable info is off the chain. 
Over here at uh, Spearing Magazine HQ, it's the same, buddy. So many noobers are submitting their adventures, lessons learned, and pictures here at SpearingMagazine.com. I just wanted to say that noobers can get an international subscription at SpearingMagazine.com. Also, they can uh, check out our In the Face Apparel or get a subscription to the greatest Spearing Magazine on the planet. That's all right here at SpearingMagazine.com. I am Jeremy Gamble, and uh, man, I love the Noob Spiro podcast. This is Jeremy out. How much time did you invest in learning how to do friends or using this course? And how long till you saw those results um, show up in your diving? Well, I took the course over uh, a winter time and I, I left uh, probably my f- second or third year in spearfishing. I, I took the course and I mean, I go down to 20, 30 feet, but before then it was a, uh, it was more of a, if I get down to 20 feet without my ears really hurting, this yeah. is, that's a good day. <laughs> um, but I, I took that course and, um, I ended up actually taking a, uh, free dive class, a level free dive level one class in the spring of that or early summer of, of that season. So the two combined with that, it just completely changed my life as a diver. Oh, awesome. So, awesome. yeah. Before that, were you, were you holding your buddies back with your performance or did they have similar concerns and issues or did you just all progress um, sort of at the same sort of speed? I think so. My core group of buddies, we, we kind of all progressed at the same, um, same rate. I ended up my one friend, he, he's a little bit better of a diver. Just, he's been doing it longer and he just naturally equalizes as well. And I mean, for, for me, like that was really the only, the really big hurdle for us. Mm. Um, but we kind of fished, we're, we're fishing in an area that, you know, you can be very successful at 30, 35 feet. So, and you kind of got to hunt around for that deeper area, mm. especially if you're not, if you don't have a boat. So, I mean, there are short dive days that you won't get under over 20 feet, mm. but be, still be successful. Yeah. 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 So ever not a, like some people think you, you have to dive 60 feet to shoot good fish. It's like, no, no, no. You just have to go to where the fish are in your area. And a lot of the time, I think a lot of ground, there's heaps of good ground in that 20 to 40 foot um, range, but that's still quite a um, significant like depth to get used to. If you don't have a background doing it and you haven't seen other oh, people 100%. do it and uh, cold water makes a difference too. Like it's, it's not easy to dive deep in cold water, like with a big thing. Oh, no, on. Not at all. But you know, I took the course and I learned so much from that course just from a, forget all the being a better diver, but the, the safety aspect from it. Um, so I, I got out of that. None of, none of my group had anyone had taken a level or any, any sort of formal training. Mm. Um, the best they do is watch a YouTube video. So I, <laughs> I started getting on them. Like, you got to take these classes and they're like, Oh no, it's fine. It's fine now. Like we're fine. We're catching the fish. I'm like, no, no, we're fine. And if you have an, a shallow water blackout, you'll be fine. Cause I'll save you, but I want you to know how to save me. So yeah, yeah. I was very, very, uh, uh, aggressive with my recruiting strategy for, <laughs> for, uh, for, for classes. So we're, I think, um, every, everyone in our group has taken a, a course or is currently, there's one guy left. He's planning on taking a course this summer. So who's your, who are your local instructors you recommend there? Um, as far as local instructors, um, there's not too many around. There's actually the one guy I took my course from, um, this guy named Dylan Courier. He lives out on the big island in Hawaii. He's an amazing diver. Okay. Uh, but he's a Rhode Island native and he comes back in the summer and teaches a couple courses. Oh, cool. But he, he's an amazing diver. He, he actually moved out to Kona to pursue free diving. Oh, wow. Um, so he, he's a, he's a really, he's an amazing instructor. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's who I took my course uh, through the rest of my friends and my brother. They, they all went down. Actually, my dad did too. They all flew down to Miami to take a, take courses over the winter because you know why not that's a great excuse to go yeah. to Florida in the winter. <laughs> for sure for sure and there's plenty of good freedom instructors in florida oh, as yeah. well and you hopefully did they get some spearing in while they were down there oh uh, they, they they it was more of to go down and go free diving or take the class um yeah i think they at the end of the at the end of one of the days they tried to go um but you know how it is. He had a class, a whole class of guys, so you couldn't get into a groove. It was the instructor and the diver. So yeah, yeah. Now we just have to sit back and plan our own trips. Yeah. So what is your dad sparing now? 
Oh yeah, we dragged him into it. He, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's awesome. He has, uh, the, he has the third spear gun I ever built. So. Oh wow, that's very cool. And was he? He loves it just as much as the rest of you guys, or? Oh yeah, no. He was he was a big reason. Well, he's the reason why I know so much about woodworking, and he's the one who used to take me and my little brother uh, fishing. So it was only natural. We still drag him out on our camping trips and hunting trips, and now spear fishing trips. So. He struggles with the, the the seasickness though. That's it. He he can get the diving down fine as long as it's a calm day. <laughs> does he take um, seasick um, pills or medication before he goes out? Yeah, he does. But when he forgets, woof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find um, if if any of my mates have any seasickness stuff, I'm just like, take your pills, take your pills, take them early. Half an hour before we're on yeah. the boat, you should be taking your pills. Because um, yep. if you try and take them when you're out there and you're already sick, it's just a waste of time. Oh yeah, no, you're just playing, trying to play catch up. But. Uh, yeah, um, but it's it, it plagues a bunch of people. Uh, I um, I'm so grateful I don't have that. Uh, you obviously don't have it either. No, yeah, not at all. Sensational. It's um, I've watched my mate like crawled up in a ball, and he's just on the floor in the boat, just like trying to sleep and just miserable. It looks awful. I, I just, oh. I, I try to have some empathy, but I've just got to go back and get in the water and. Shoot some more fish. I'm sorry, bro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, they look so miserable when they have it. But it's just like, well, the fishing's good and the water's, the water's clear. I'm just going gonna, gonna to be over there in the water. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do, too. It's so callous. Eh? I, I do feel guilty, but, um, but I don't, it doesn't stop me. Um, no. Still so, going to take pictures at him, of him yeah. and, t- and text them to him later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What about um, scary stuff? Have you guys got um, had some... Scary stuff, tough situations there where you've um, got a fright and maybe learned something from it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, that that's kind of I've I've actually had we had I had one uh, last year that really made me a little bit more uh, safety conscious. Um, so we were diving in forty feet of water, so nothing nothing crazy deep, but still deep enough for things to go wrong. Mm. Um, so what we were in forty feet of water relatively no current um not great viz but then again not 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 great but not horrible um it was the first first drop or two of the day and i you know i did my breathe up equal, did my pre-equalization pre-equalization dropped down went down to 40 feet we were kind of off the reef so i went up and yelled to the uh the guy on the boat to check where we were on the charts and he's like hey you know you're coming up on it you're going to be dri- next drop you should be on the reef so I dropped down, got down, we were on the reef, but I turned my head, all of a sudden I felt this whooshing sound. I heard, I heard a whooshing noise and my, completely my equilibrium just went and I didn't know which way was up. Um, oh, wow. I got all dizzy. It was, it was wild. I had no idea what happened. Um, so I started swimming what I thought was up, but no, I was going sideways um, and saw like a jellyfish go by my face sideways. I'm like, oh, that's, I'm not swimming up. So I ended up, reorienting myself sw- swam to the surface got out of the boat i was nauseous and you know i it was not having a good day i was disoriented my ear felt all immediately puffy and dull i couldn't hear well out of that ear uh saw an ear no- nose and throat uh, specialist and basically had some trauma on one of my ears and due to that difference in pressure that's what caused the equilibrium issues luckily i didn't dive again um and played it safe and stayed on the boat um and Turns out, so I, str- I struggled with that for a long time, not knowing what had caused that. I didn't know if there was something that I had, like some sort of internal blockage in my sinuses. Um, I just, I couldn't, couldn't wrap myself around it. And every time I went for a drop, I'd think about, is my ear, even though I'm equalized and I know I'm equalized, because at that point I'd known how to equalize. And I just we struggled with that lurking fear of this happening again, because I didn't have an explanation why. Mm. So I was in 15 feet of water. Um, th- it was, this was this year. I was in 15, 20 feet of water, and I turned my head, and I felt it was, again, beginning of the dive. And I turned my head, and I felt this little whooshing noise. But I didn't feel the pressure because I wasn't that deep. And what it was was my wetsuit had sealed up around my face. And when I was equalizing, uh-huh. I wasn't you know, fully equalizing because the pressure really wasn't there. And then when I got and I turned my head, it, would, it let, let the pressure into my ear. Well, come to find out that I'm not the only person that that's happened to. And that's why a lot of people do the pinholes in their yeah. ears. So, I was just or just vent it. 
I was just going to mention yeah. that. So have, is that what you've now done to your wetsuits? Oh, yeah. So walk us through how you do that. So I just put the wetsuit hood on, yep. um, figure out where, where my ear holes are, and I just take a Sharpie marker and, you know, just kind of mark where the ear holes are. Yep. Uh, and then take the hood off and kind of stretch it out a little bit and then heat up a, a pin, like a, like a sewing needle, and just poke a little hole through it. And it'll melt it and it'll singe it and it'll be ni- nice and tidy. You'll never see it. You don't feel it venting cold water, just like I used to, to get the work around is you just can dump water in, but then you yeah. have all that you're trying to breathe nah. up and relax and get your heart rate and stick your head in an ice cream. You so. want, you want your dive gear to do the work like that for you. Like, um, Oh yeah. Yeah. So that sounds like a great idea. So where did you learn that technique from? Um, I think I Googled it or YouTube. I've seen it before and I've know. heard it before, but it's great to go over the same ground. So when the ENT um, had a good look in your ear and discussed this issue with you, um, what did they advise you for healing time? And what was that healing process like? Did you have to take any medication? So I took some medicine just to combat the infection, so potential con- infection. So that's a normally that that portion of your, your middle ear is you know vented and there's no fluid or shouldn't be any fluid in there. So the second you, you have that trauma, it fills up with fluid as your body's uh, response to, to try to protect your inner ear, mm. you know, the really sensitive part. Um, but now you have the, all this fluid in your ear um, and it's pretty thick and it takes a lot, a long time to drain out of, through your eustachian tubes. Um, so it's a hotbed for infection. So they gave me some medicine to combat that, uh, some antibiotics and really it was just rest. Uh, don't, don't, of course, don't dive. How long? And, Can you remember how long you didn't dive for? Yeah, they, they told me three to six. Well, they told me that my diving was done forever. Um, yeah. But I went and a friend of mine is actually, uh, and a coworker of mine, he's a, he's a dive master. He's a scuba dive master. Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, no, don't, don't listen to the ENTs. Yeah. I mean, he's like, listen to the ENTs. They're doctors. But there's a specific set of um, the, a specific knowledge for dive medicine that ENTs just aren't, they're not up to speed on that. So he gave me this number for um, Divers Alert Network. Yep. And they're just, uh, they help out with, they do a lot of dive injury scuba stuff. divers, dive injuries. They do a lot of like bari- barrio trauma and um, they do have the, the um, bariatric chambers if you yeah. have, um, for a lot more for the scuba side of things. Um, but I got on the phone with one of their doctors and talked a long time and it, and, and really what they explain, they walk me through my symptoms and they're like, you know what? you really didn't have this trauma and here's how to explain it to the doctor ENT and maybe they'll, they'll reassess your, your, um, diagnosis. So what they, what they had thought is they had thought because I got that dizziness when an e, a normal ENT hears that dizziness, um, they're like, eardrum. Oh, you ruptured, ruptured eardrum, you're done. And yep. any, any further pressure changes on your eardrum, yep. you're going to have, it's, it's a, it's a weak point. Yep. Um, but talking with the Dan doctor they, you know, they're like, you know, in this case, because your your dizziness and your vertigo went away very, very quickly, they're like, if you actually had ruptured it, you would be in the boat throwing up. You would be, you wouldn't be able to drive yourself home. Um, you definitely have injury. Uh, you have an injury there. You have to let it heal itself, but you didn't cause permanent damage to your eardrum. It's good. In, it's um, good so encouragement, I think, because I there there are there there are a portion of people out there that think that they can never dive again, and sometimes I think that they've been misdiagnosed just due to inadequate knowledge basically of what it is oh, yeah. that we do and 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 what's actually happened to people like but you know like significant trauma in your ears is significant but it's not always that it's you know you're not you might not necessarily have done anything that's permanent um so that's kind of why i wanted to uncover your story a little bit more too oh yeah no it was huge i it was it was kind of a i walked out of the doctor when he told me that and it was just like what am i getting into? Like I just started the spear gun building business. It's all I eat, treat, eat, sleep, and dream spear fishing. Like, how am I going to put this down? But at the same time, I don't want to endanger my family and w- leave them without a father. So I, I went and just sought off, sought after that knowledge from the Dan guys. And that really, I mean, I had to, to weigh exactly what my symptoms were. And it wasn't just like, oh, just talk to this guy. And he said it was cool. It would put a lot of time and effort and discussion into just uh, the symptoms and the causes. Now, for people, if they haven't experienced like that loss of equilibrium where you don't know where up is, up, you know, you don't know where up is, you don't know where down is, you don't know where you're going, you've lost, 
your full orientation and you're underwater holding your breath, um, you know, if you can put yourself in that position, then you can start to understand the gravity of the situation. At any time during that, did you um, get the sense to possibly drop your weight belt? Uh, to be honest with you, that it makes so much sense at this point. Um, <laughs> also, I was on a, I was also on a, on a gun with a float, so I could have just climbed the line too. Yep. Yep. I mean, I had a lot of options to me, but to, to me, in, it happened just like that. And I hadn't reached the point where I started to think about, like, I'm in a really bad spot now. I was just reacting. So I started to swim back up. You know, it was a pretty matter of fact, oh, well, I'm going to go up now. Um, and then I saw, I thought I was going up. And then I saw the, the jellyfish go by. I'm like, well, I'm not going up. Well, now I'm going up. And then I got up. So it wasn't, I didn't get to the end of my breath hold. I was still very fresh on my, my breath hold. So um, just, I just got to take that one and try to, I try to tell everyone I can about that story. So just maybe, maybe in the future, yeah, take your weight belt off, hold that up in front of your, your face. So a, you get a, you get a chance to say which way is actually up and B, if you do have a blackout, you're going to more than likely float to the surface really easy. Love it. Good stuff. Well, lessons learned for everyone there. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I had a mate Duncan a while ago ask me like, um, if I'd thought of running a competition to see who had actually ever ditched their weight belt. Because it's something we all kind of know, like, oh, yeah, I've got this quick ditch release system on my weight belt, but none of us ever do it. Like um, <laughs> like most of us, even if we're on the, you know, if you've done a longer dive for whatever reason or you've been held up, none of us even hold the weight belt in one hand out like we've all been taught to do. And that way, like, it'll self-ditch, you know, if you lose consciousness or whatever, you can just hold the belt in one hand, none of us do it though, and uh, it's like this this great safety idea that we all have and think about when we're telling stories, but we never actually do it in real life situations. So it's an interesting one. Yeah, no, I know. It's like it's almost like an afterthought because I've, I've had this. You know, you're down for a little longer than you should. You're starting to come up, and you're like, oh well, I really could use some oxygen right about now. You get to the surface, and right right about you can see the divers like their face, and you're like, oh, I could have just did. Could have could have thought about ditching the belt a lot earlier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not that I needed it in those instances, but just, yeah, we don't we don't think about it as much as we should. I think. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, but it's just it's an obvious point, you know. It's all we've got all that ballast on. That's what we can do. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times but there is a way to do it safer and smarter take down more fuel to maximize the time that you have there learn at noobspiro.com forward slash ted with ted hardy from immersion freediving if you take down more fuel you can stay for longer learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal ted breaks it down for you with a free online course noobspiro.com forward slash ted take down 20 to 30 percent more air just by learning how to take a full breath again Learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash TED. Hey guys, how about increasing your breath hold even though you aren't even near the water? I think you'll agree with me when I say contractions suck. But what if I told you there was a way to relax and steadily push them back and to do it safely? Freediving for spearfishers at howtofreedive.com will help you to extend your breath hold understand your body better and put you in a better position when you actually get to go out spearfishing. It's not for noobs though, as this program is more for advanced spearos who who have some diving under their belts and understand basic spearfishing safety. But it's perfect for spearos who want a guided program with videos, a clear process to follow and a set goal. The 5 minute freediver works. Check it out. You can start for free, check out the course, see if you like it. If you use the code noobspero you'll save some money when you do purchase. Check it out at howtofreedive.com. So, with your spear guns, like, where to from here? Like, what, what's in the development at, at the moment? Um, what can you see yourself happening in the near future? Um, for me, I'm just trying to, I think I got a design that really, really works. It's um, as far as the, the, the shape of the gun. I think it, it blends the being rather affordable, but also a really unique gun um, and also the, all the options. And I'm not at a volume right now where I could ever automate this process. I, and I think 
automating that process would would really take something out of the hand built aspect of it. I mean, I guess you could say it's still hand built, but to me, I I, have, I really do love the 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 hand shaping aspect of it, and kind of like surfboards, like they have surfboards that are mm. CNC routed, but at the same time, there's there's the really special ones are the hand shaped boards. Yeah, kind of kind of the way I go about this one, these guns. Um, I've been messing around with rollers. I'm not much of a roller guy. I really like the simplicity of a band gun, but yep. everyone loves the rollers these days. Yeah. Well, they, um, like you can understand from a physics point of view how they probably make sense, but I'm kind of like you. Like I've gone the roller route and then I go back to a conventional banded gun. And Duncan Henderson recently built, built me another uh, a pipe gun with a, with a single roller, and the thing's just a friggin' laser. Like it, yeah. Like I, I pulled the trigger on it, and I was just like, "Oh, yeah, the, my shaft normally stops there, and it just keeps going and going and going and going." And like it just, oh, yeah, don't. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, but, yeah. No, don't get me wrong. I so I'm actually an engineer by yeah. by degree and trade. That's what I do, and I I can look at the numbers and but it, and I have friends who are like I want a roller gun, and you know I'm I'm actually building a, a couple of roller guns right now just because people that's what people want. Um, but to me, at, at the it's at a certain point, I just I love the simplicity of the, the the band guns and just the ability to be just under the water. You don't have to worry about that thing going. Um, I mean, there's not to be honest with you, there's not that much that can go wrong more with a, a roller gun. There's just a little bit more that in, in that whole system that I don't know. I just I'm a simple guy. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I bet I battle with it. I go backwards and forwards with it, but um. Yeah, I, I have yet to add a timber spear gun to my arsenal. It's coming, though. I've got a few different um, – obviously, um, Ed Martin from Killshot Spear Guns and the Keys, he sponsors the podcast. So he's been oh, yeah. meaning to build me a blue water gun for a while, and uh, I really love the look of them. I really want one. I've fired off a timber platform before, and I love just how stable it is in your hand, and it just feels beautiful. The tracking is actually not that much more than a pipe gun, um, but – yeah, I don't know. I just I, I love shooting off that platform. I, I do think I want to go a roller though with it, but um, yeah, we'll see how we go. Oh yeah. So your your prototypes? Would you, you use your social media? Are you showing people sort of um, the process of building? Are you telling them about what you're developing next? Um, do you engage with people and or do, or is it more of a custom type thing where guys just reach out and they say, "Hey, I really want one of these. I see you build guns, and I know you. You build good stuff. And but how does it work?" Well, so it's really the, the social media is kind of what founded this company, really. It was just me posting on a couple spear spear gun building forums that kind of was the inception of the business. Um as far as the I don't I don't build I don't have any guns that are just laying around ready for me to to sell at a, that drop of a hat. It's really someone comes to me and they said, Hey, I, this is the gun I want. I want a 90 centimeter mid handle, two bands, and then we just work from there. Um, to option it out or spec it out, and then I'll go off and build it. But the social—I—I I, I love the social media. It's a great way to just go out and I mean, I have fun with it. Just hey, here's some pictures of me building a gun. Here's my yeah. shop. Here's some. Yeah. Here, look, check out this new tool. Yeah. And, and really, that's—it's been a pretty cool way to just get what I'm doing out there. Mm. Uh, show a little bit of the process. Maybe throw a couple pictures of cooking fish or just being on the water. Just. I don't know. I feel most, most spear fishermen, I mean, by nature, you got to cook the fish, right? Yeah. So th they, they enjoy the cooking aspect of it and then just being on the water. So. I'm looking at one of your tog chowder um, images right now. It looks like a good, uh, tasty winter meal to eat. So. Oh, man. Yeah. I was gifted that recipe by a, a club, a, one of our club officials. Mm. He's a way better diver than most anyone out there. <laughs> <laughs> So, in terms of componentry, um, are you have you spec'd your own, or are you uh, ordering mostly Neptonics gear? Um, um, so I started off with Neptonics everything. Um, I, I love that. I personally love their triggers. Mm. Um, they're super rugged, no frills, just a working man's trigger. Um, I still have actually the original trigger I ever started with, and I just put new stocks on it just because. <laughs> I just been upgrading the stock around the trigger. Um, but the, the big thing these days is everyone loves those Hermes roller necks. Mm. Um, so I, I, I started to build a couple of those and man, those are super smooth. Um, just, just the trigger pull on them is just incredible. 
Um, like trying to get a bit more of that hair trigger type pull like you do out of a firearm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really what it feels like. It, it, it's the closest thing I've, on a spear gun I've ever felt to a, a like an actual firearm. It has that break and release um, that you just don't get out of most spear gun triggers there. But going back to my keep it simple, uh, I like a I like a just a super simple gun with a super rugged trigger. So my personal guns will probably always have the Niptonics triggers on them. But are you making uh, big blue water stuff as well, or is it predominantly? Um, like- like um, guns that are more suited to your local conditions. I'm, I'm really trying to do whatever, whatever the customer wants, to be honest with you. Um, I, of course I started off with uh, these, what I called the breakwater gun. It was really it was 65 centimeter mid handle guns. So the, the, the gun, the handles literally in the center of the, the, the stock itself. Um, just a nice hole gun. Um, that's kind of what started the whole thing. Um, and then I started to get the big, the gun, the gun range around here, everyone shoots like 80 to 110 band gun. That's what, that's like the sweet spot for the local conditions. Mm. Um, you start, start heading offshore and you get a little bit bigger. Um, so, but that's really what the only guns I really built up until, um, another, another one of our club members approached me about, he was going down to, uh, do some deep reef diving off of North Carolina and he wanted a big, uh, he wanted a 140. So I built him a 140 and, I fell in love with that gun, so I had to build one for myself. Uh, <laughs> planning a couple trips around it, so. But we're gonna we're gonna try. You know, it's a good size for like mahi mahi and uh, a little bit clear because it definitely have the range on it. But hopefully, gonna get into some blue water fishing this summer. So maybe uh, build a big blue water gun to show the crowds what uh what a blue water ocean state spear gun will will do. Yeah, nice, nice. What about shafts? Are you using something local? I use Spearcrafter shafts. They're, okay. uh, the, they make them down in Florida, um, but I, I think their process and th- their component is by far the best, at least readily available to me. I'm looking at a picture of a porgy right now, and it's actually very similar to a brim. It, is, it looks like a, oh, yeah. it's a Lajana species, is it? Or I, I believe so. I, it's funny you mentioned that. I mean, everywhere, every species, every location seems to have a very similar because you got see guys shooting brim in the the med, and they're like, "Oh, look at this!" I'm like, "No, oh, that's a porgy." Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's got to roll up under the same family somehow. Yeah. They taste good too, though, don't they? They Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I like them. Yeah, awesome. Um, so do you ever get offshore and do some of the blue water stuff yourself, the mahi and so on? Um. Not really, not late. Um, to be honest with you, I've, it's kind of one of those things that you get into spear fishing and uh, kind of do the inshore stuff, and then kind of want to venture into deeper waters. I'm not trying to push it. Yeah. Um, I do go when we go down to North Carolina. We do, it's not true blue water. We're not chasing pelagics, but it's um, we go probably 10, 15 miles offshore, and we do drop on wrecks. There's a lot of wrecks out there off of the east coast of North Carolina. Yes. Yeah, um, but trying to get out to Hawaii, hopefully with COVID, the COVID restrictions don't change, but in a couple of weeks should, should be getting out to Hawaii doing some blue water hunting. Yeah, out there. Wow. Actually, yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Do you, when you travel like that, do you try and get out with a guide? Uh, yeah. I, I, if I'm going to travel somewhere and go through the pain and the effort of dragging my guns around, because of course I'm going to bring my guns. <laughs> can't, can't, can't see another manufacturer's guns in my hands, even though. They're probably probably will do have the same result, but you know I'm I, I want to have my guns in in front of the, the camera, yeah, yeah. Um, and really put them through the test because that's in the end of the day that's that's what got me to spear fishing was my love for or spear gun building was my love for spear fishing. Mm. So, so I'm going to go through all the time and effort to travel with them because they're not easy to travel with. I'm gonna yeah. I want to I want to maximize my my efforts and and my chances of coming home with something and really seeing what this landscape is because. Every place has its own. The factors are different. Um, there's dominant factors that you got to really pay attention to that coming from somewhere else you're not going to even think about. Have you thought about making yourself a travel spear gun? I have. And th- th- there's some pretty slick hardware on the market. Um, mm. Definitely something I've thought about building, but I have a list of like three or four projects in the back of my head that I've wanted to dabble <laughs> with. But luckily, I've just been uh, inundated with orders that I, and uh, I'm trying to. Keep up with the orders, which is a good thing. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm really trying to go through some some big shop upgrades yep. to get my tooling where where it really can support production. Yeah. Nice. Oh, it's good. Good. Good problems to have. Um, yeah, I'm I'm excited about it. People can come and check out um, Ocean State Spear Guns and see your journey on Instagram there as well. But um, I might link up some uh, images in today's show notes if people want to go to noobspear.com forward slash. I'm just going to do OSS, I think. How's yeah, that? that's Ocean great. Ocean State Spear Guns. But um, I like what you're doing, man. It looks cool. Salt and water make for a deadly combination when it comes to dive gear. That's why you need to visit oldmanblue.com.au. They use the finest in materials and they make stuff to last. They use 316 marine grade stainless steel in their loops and they source their materials and make their own stuff right there in Western Australia. Catch bags, cray loops and more. Visit oldmanblue.com.au. Check it out. Equalizing problems can be something that derail you. Not today, my friend. Go to freedivingfamily.com. Check out the either the Friends or Advanced Friends or video or the Mouthful and Deep Friends or Equalization course at freedivingfamily.com. You can use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. These courses are put together by Adam Stern and a select team of, of, of legends and to help you overcome different issues and help you perform better. And some of them are extremely relevant for freedive spearing. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Funniest stuff. Uh, sounds like you've got a lively crew of buddies there. You guys get up to mischief and uh, have a good time out there? Oh, we have a good time. We're always, always, always just trying to fit it in between everything else, you know. Mm. But uh, no, we have a good time. Any poo stories? Oh, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to call it the funniest uh, stories anymore. I'm just going to call it <laughs> poo stories. I'm, uh, <laughs> my mother's listening to this at some point. She'll probably be embarrassed, but I'm the guy who's known for the uh, nature poos, wherever, whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> so spearfishing is no, no different. Do you, have a, um, do you have a Bushman's friend? Like, I don't know, if, like this is growing up in New Zealand, like uh, the bush out the back, we had these these um, leaves that were like they call them Bushman's friend because you know like they were they would not toxic to your skin and you could use them as a toilet paper. Do you have Bushman's friend there? Since you're a na- uh, since you're a nature poor. <laughs> I mean, anyone that's not three leaves, don't just don't don't use the three leaves. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does that do? Burn. Uh, yeah, no, you got itchy blisters. There's poison Whoa. oak, poison ivy, poison sumac, and they're all shiny three-leaved species. So any, even if it's remotely re- looks like it just now. Oh, wow. <laughs> so spearfishing is no different for you. You're a bit of a nature, when nature calls, what, what, what way you nature, go? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ever tried to relax and do a breathe up with that feeling? No, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I was just talking about it. Like, it's the... I think the mammalian dive reflex, maybe with blood shift too, but also, you know, like just filling up your lungs properly naturally forces um, pressure downwards into your digestive system. So it's just, I think it's just part of part of spearing. It's a thought. I don't know. Have you? Uh, what's what? What's one of your memorable ones? Um, <laughs> I was out with my brother and. Uh, Two of my buddies, and we were actually, and my fa- my father was on the boat for this one, and I uh, it was first we were getting suited up, and I was like, you know, before I get to the, the wetsuit, nature calls, so I, I no one really knew what I was doing, but I was out on the swim platform adopting this nice um, aiming posture away from the boat and everything. <laughs> <laughs> my brother was taking a nice panoramic picture, and like. I guess he was trying to take a video or like scan this, the horizon. Yeah. And it timed up so perfectly that he went and panned and you could just see, he was like headshot. Like he was facing me head on and yeah. just, you could see everything just. And then you were just a, a poodle humping a tennis ball <laughs> and, and out the back came uh, nature. <laughs> yep. <laughs> ah, brilliant. I love it. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Everyone appreciates an aquatude. Oh yeah, every sparrow has a poo story. Yeah, hundred um, percent. All right, what about the rest of your dive bag? So we've got an Ocean State spear gun in there, or five. Um, what mm-hmm. else are you using? Um, any gear preferences? 
Um, I uh, I have a, a Mako wetsuit um, and a Savamar wetsuit. They're both about the same price, but to me, wetsuits are almost like a consumable item just because they get beat up and they get old and mm. tore up. Kind of cycle through those. So. How many seasons do you get out of a suit? What do you expect out of a suit? I have a pretty beat up uh, old Mako that it's three mil. I don't know. The three mils are hard though because, you know, they start to get thinner and compressed, but you just use them. Le- you use them just more as like a two mil almost. Yeah. Um, yeah, I that, think that's I have four years on this one. So. Yeah, okay. That's pretty good out of a three mil. I think sometimes you can have a five mil and two seasons, then it's more like a three mil, and then yeah, you get another couple of seasons out of it, and then it's replacement time. But um, it is good how you can do that, eh? Yeah. Um, what else? And you get back um, knives, fins, masks. Yeah, I got I got some uh, I got a pair of Mako fiberglass fins. That was huge. The huge step between plastic fins and the fiberglass fins was huge. Mm. Um, I've been I have my eye on a couple of carbon fiber fins, but for me, it's not the difference between fiberglass and carbon. I'm sure it's it's a big step. Everyone's like, you got to get the carbon fins, which I'm I'm really excited about getting, but. Um, right now I'm just not going to fix it until it breaks because we, we do a lot of rock hopping and yeah, they get pretty abused. So th- they have some pretty deep gouges in the fiberglass, but they still, they're still holding up. Yeah. Fine, awesome. So. Awesome. That's what you want out of them. What about gloves and booties, other consumables? Um, I really like those Dyneema cut proof gloves. Yeah. Um, I just worry a little bit less about you know, braining the fish and just knife work in general. Um, but we have to go with some three mil and three mil and up gloves. A lot of the, on the shoulder seasons, once it starts getting cold. Yeah. Yeah. So how long does your core season last? Like with warm water and. Um, define warm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what are we talking? Into, into April, into April, we'll, we'll start getting into the, the, the 50 degree hitting the 50 degree mark. Yeah. Um, and honestly, it's however long you want to stay in the water, really. Um, guys were shooting this year, they were shooting deep into December. I've personally seen some, actually the guy who got me started in the spear fishing, he shot a striper last year, a striped bass shot. He shot one of those, I think the first week of December. Oh, wow. It was, it was after Thanksgiving. I just remember the water. So the, the water temperature still stays pretty relative, uh, relatively warm um, later in the season. Um, so you can be relatively comfortable in the water, but the second you get out of the water, you got to run to the run to the truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Warm water in there in a thermos or something. Oh yeah, yeah, and nice. towels and yeah, all the whole the whole thing. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, let's um let's head on out with a faster pace. Round of questions, Spiro Q and A. You ready to rock? Let's go. All right. If you had to start all over again, what would you do differently? Pick up spear fishing about fifteen years earlier. <laughs> <laughs> what would be your fish of a lifetime? Oh man, I would love a tuna. Yeah. I love eating them. I think they're beautiful fish, and just the size of those that are impressive and really test your gear. All right. What's something a little different from everyone else that you do? Something different than ever than everyone else. Uh, Always have an ocean state spear gun in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you went with the self with the went with the self promo <laughs> angle. I love it. All right. Um what's the single best resource for improving your spearfishing? Um I, I would say that, that that's a tie for uh having a club and a, a big big resource or a big group of people that you can bounce ideas off of and get advice from. Uh they know your local the local area, the local water, the local species. Definitely lean on your local clubs if you're lucky enough. Yeah, a huge resource was Noob Spiro. I, I, I think 75 to 80% of all my spearfishing knowledge I've accumulated has been listening, listen, and listening to the show. So. You, you must be sick of my voice. It's great. Ah, to be honest <laughs> with you, I absolutely love the accents. Oh, cool. Cool. One of the few Americans that does probably, apart from when I do my terrible knockoff American accents. What do you oh, think? that's 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 gold. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the, love the ads. The ads in the American accent is just like, oh my god, this is ridiculous. Yeah, I go for that. I go for that. 
Um, you were saying before we started, like, um, you've really loved being part of a community of gun builders and you found like, you found it amazing how, how helpful, um, so many, um, innovators were in the, in the spear gun making space. Are there any like resources for people that are wanting to build their own guns and stuff? Like, are there any places that you would recommend that they go if they want to do, you know, similar stuff and projects to you? Um, to be honest with you, reach, just reach out to your local builder. People have started to do it to me. They've, they've, they've been asking for tips and tricks. Um, um, I've actually a couple of local guys want to do their own builds, uh, but they didn't have the, the resources and maybe the know-how to get a blank started. So I, I built a couple of blanks for some guys just to, just to get them started. But I think just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of small time builders out there building custom guns that to, in my opinion, I, I, in my experience, I've, I've had really, really good resort, uh, results just talking with. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So people can come find you. You're at, um, oceanstatespearguns.com or on Instagram as Ocean State Spear Guns. People can check out today's show notes, noobspear.com forward slash OSS. And uh, I'll link all that stuff up on there, Matthew. But um, man, it's been mint uh, talking to you and catching up with you. I, I know you've been listening to the podcast for a while, so it's great to get you on and hear a bit of your story and um, and talk spear guns for sure. Yeah, man, it's an honor. <laughs> oh, good. Well, um. Let's stay in touch, man, into the future. And um, you're always welcome to come and plug me with uh, more spear gun info as it comes up into the future. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. Ocean State Spear Guns, guys. Matthew Novakovich, thanks very much for coming on the podcast, buddy. Hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. I'd really encourage you to check out his Instagram. He's got some really cool cuddle-shaped timber spear gun barrels coming out. And uh, quite an engaging Instagram too. He's a, he's a rad dude. Really enjoyed today's chat. And uh, next week's chat, not much different. I really enjoyed that one as well. Uh, it's Jamie Rives. And we're talking, he's a former Norfolk Islander, now living in Vanuatu with his lovely family. And uh, absolutely slaying fish and making really cool videos that take him days to upload using the internet there. And uh, Dogtooth Tuna, we talk all sorts of wicked stuff in this interview. The interview actually cost me $159 to record <laughs> due to the international calling uh, rates that I found out about after. But anyway, uh, Jamie and I had a good laugh about that, and it's a really cool interview. So come back next week. If you love the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash noobspero, jump on there and support the podcast on an episode by episode basis. As usual though, keep frothing my friends. Hope you're getting out and spearing and being safe while you're doing it. All good trick out. The Noob Spear Podcast is incredibly proud to be partnering with Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. It's the very best in spearing gear from around the planet. Neptonics is also the one-stop shop for all your spearfishing gear, particularly in the US. They got free shipping on all orders over $99 in the US. Furthermore, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off on your entire shopping basket at Neptonics.com. Use the code NOOBSPEAR at Neptonics.com. Today's episode was an absolute banger. And so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in store at some of their huge mega stores Australia wide. Price be guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear.